This is chapter four for the class Hydrological Processes and Ecosystems, and the topic is Tropical Forest Ecohydrology. Now back in chapter two, I presented a basic forest plot scale water balance, and I showed you how you could assess through fall, interception, and stem flow as the three primary water fluxes that were taking place. And then along with that, in some cases, there was the storage component on the tree. Um, so that gave us the water fluxes and water storage for the hydrological water balance. Now I want to move from the examples I gave in the temperate and semi-arid forests. Um, for example, I talked about Spain and I talked about um, Scotland. Now I want to move to the tropical context because things play out somewhat differently when we look at those same variables. And I also want to look across some different spatial scales. This topic is going to be divided into two video podcasts. The first one, which is this one, is going to introduce the climate zonation of the Earth and how we look at that, uh, and then what that means for ecohydrology, specifically in the tropics. To motivate that at the scale of an individual tree, I'm going to present two case studies of through-fall interception and stem flow in the tropical forest at the scale of an individual tree. Okay, well the first thing is that I haven't really taken the time in this class to talk about climate per se. And of course, climate is something that exists all over the world and typically measured in terms of temperature and precipitation driven by energy from the sun. Um, but there are the dynamics in terms of wind flow, uh, wind flow, you know, heat and moisture flow. So it's not just about precipitation and temperature, although that's what people often focus on. Um, what I want to show you for a few minutes is a simulation that's been provided by NCAR um, from the Community Climate Model 3. Um, it's a very high resolution model um, that has showing an hourly simulation for, um, it's for a whole year, but I'm only going to show you the first half of the year. And I'll also make this video available to you on the class website where you're watching this so you can look at it more on your own in detail. I'm not going to go through the whole thing um, in real time. What you can see in this video when I get it started is clouds are shown in white to gray and then rainfall is shown in orange. And what I want you to do is try to think about some of the processes that are taking place and I'll be um, commenting on that as the video plays. And I want you to think about that. This is going to be seeing the template for the ecohydrology that's taking place at the Earth's surface. So let's begin and then I'll start uh, with some commentary. Um, okay, so what you can see here is that we have these wind patterns that are taking shape um, up here and we have the jet stream that's coming across and we also have these winds that are going across, okay? And then in the middle, we have this relatively calmer condition with the wind pattern predominantly going in the other direction. So this is standard. If you open up any oceanography textbook, atmospheric textbook, you'll see these global climate driven patterns. Now what you can see is that during the winter we do have this uh, cloud belt that's in the tropics um, but it actually isn't particularly big. We could also see in winter time that there are these bands of rain that are coming across and hitting us here in California. If I'm, I'm going to take my first time here to rewind um, and I'm going to go forward and back and you can really see how these whip across and hit us here where I am here in California. You could also see on the eastern seaboard how moisture from the Gulf of Mexico comes, forms and comes up, um, puts rain and precipitation into uh, um, the eastern states and then heads across to the UK and Spain and provides those nice uh, winter wet conditions that are, that are there. Um, at this time, if we look over in Asia, you can see that it's pretty calm. Um, it's not a particularly wet period that's taking place there. So now I'm going to fast forward a bit here and get us more towards the summer. Um, and one thing you can see is that for much of this period, there's not a lot that's taking place down in this part um, off of Baja and Mexico on the western coast in the Pacific there. Um, so that's a relatively dry time. Now I'm going to fast forward um, to the very end. If we go to August, you're going to see in that same zone 
how now we have these bands of moisture that come up and these actually create these very intense thunderburst, um, thunder, or cloudburst thunderstorms that cause um, flash floods and debris flows in that area. And that's something we'll be talking more about when we look at the rangelands. Um, so if you, if you contrast the winter time when the tropics are relatively sparse with um, clouds, and then you head into the, to the summertime, let's get up into May here, look at the cloud cover now that's taking place over India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. It's totally full, and so now we're into more of the monsoonal period with large amounts, well it's still a little early, but um, heading into the monsoonal period and then as we head into the summer, large amounts of summer precipitation, which is in you know, sharp contrast to the fact that we have wintertime precipitation here in California. So the main reason why I'm showing this again is to just illustrate that the hydrology that we're looking at is largely dependent on this larger systematic relationship between the ocean, the atmosphere, and the land. Uh, you can see, for example, again, looking at the Himalayas, the way that the mountains there um, act as an orographic barrier for moisture getting up into the steppes to the north. So it's really important when we think about a particular region, and today we're focusing on the tropics, to understand the context of the climate. And so this is just a helpful tool. This isn't real weather, but it is a nice simulation. Um, okay. So looking at the climate of the Earth as a whole, there was a scientist named Holdridge who came up with this climate plant classification system, and it summarized in this next torturing device that I'm going to throw at you, which is called a ternary diagram. If you haven't seen a ternary diagram before, then this is a good time to learn it. It's actually a very powerful tool. We see them quite a lot in the geosciences. It's a way of showing how multiple variables are interacting and how we can classify a variety of things in that. We often see them in soils where you have sand, silt, and clay as the basis for a soil classification for text soil texture. But in this case, we have three variables. If you start at the bottom and you go up the triangle, that's giving us the mean annual biotemperature. Now, what's biotemperature? Well, as I've written in the text here, the biotemperature is the average temperature that you get if you consider only days when it's not freezing, and then any day when it is freezing, you just set the temperature to zero degrees Celsius. So you average in all the zeros along with temperatures above zero, and that gives you the biotemperature. The idea behind that is simply that uh, plants aren't doing anything when it's below freezing, so it doesn't want to factor that in. In any case, so the way that this diagram works is you start at the bottom. At the bottom, we actually have, uh, well, see, now it's even more confusing, because to torture you, this classification system, um, instead of going up, as many do with the triangle, it actually goes down. So we have to start at this line here, this dashed line, uh, where it says polar conditions, or altitude belts, could be this naval conditions, where we have um, a mean annual biotemperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. As you go straight down, the temperature is increasing, 3, 6, 12, 24. So to make matters even worse, not only is it going down, but it's also a nonlinear scheme um, as, the, as the size of the change in temperature is increasing as you go down. So it's not to scale. Um, now the next thing you can do is we can look at another variable. So if we, if we consider this um, line on the left to be a base, and then we go to the lower right, we're now actually ascending a triangle that's in units of average total annual precipitation. And this actually is more sensible because the values here, so it goes from 6 to 12 and a half to 25 to 50, so it's a, it's a doubling scale. Um, so it's, you know, actually these are all doubling scales, so that's interesting, but it's, so it's a nonlinear scale. In any case, you're heading up values in this direction, okay, and that goes to total annual precipitation. And then if you consider this upper right line to be the base and you ascend to the lower left, we're now increasing in what's called potential evapotranspiration. So remember, evapotranspiration would be like the millimeters of water that are evapotranspiring away. Potential means that given the climate you have, this is the maximum that could take place given the energy that that climate's providing. Now, usually the landscape doesn't have as much water available as could um, evapotranspire. So this is what's the potential that's driving it. And a desert is a good example. Um, 
it's it, this is also instead of rate, this is the ratio, and the ratio just means that you're looking at that ET and dividing it by the gross precipitation. And so a value here of one means that you have exactly as much potential ET as you have precipitation. So anything more than that would represent relatively dry conditions because you can remove more of the water than is provided each year. And that's why you can see the word desert, particularly in this, in this section in the left. So, um, so again, so if you start from the top and go down, we're going to warmer conditions. As we go from kind of the top to the right, or you know, uh, upper left to the lower right, then we're going to wetter conditions, and upper right to lower left, we're going to um, more evapotranspiring, drier conditions. So I'll probably give you some exercises to help get a sense of how to read values. But for example, in this lower left corner, we have a desert. That's the place with the highest potential evapotranspiration ratio, the lowest precipitation, because precipitation is in this band from 6 to 12, okay? And then temperature is more than 24 degrees Celsius. So that would be, you know, hot and dry. If you stay at that same temperature band and go across, we're shifting from high ET to low ET, and we're going to really high precipitation rates. So everything's linked together, and now we're in a tropical rainforest. Okay, so that's how this classification works. And you know, we're generally, in this class, focusing on uh, tropical conditions today, but we've also been looking at a range of conditions. We'll also be looking in the future at um, more um, dry or arid land conditions, like, like deserts or, uh, or semi-arid. We're not going to be dealing with, you know, glacial and paraglacial or tundra conditions in this class. So if we look more specifically at the characteristics of the tropics in terms of hydrology and ecology, and we contrast that with the, the temperate conditions, generally the temperature is hotter. We ha usually have more precipitation in the tropics, but biologically there's a lot more things going on. In the previous examples, if you go back to chapter two, you'll see that there was really low tree diversity. It was usually a single species stand, um, and now we're looking at stands that may have 30 to 70 species present in the study sites. Trees are a little bit taller. They definitely have more interlocking canopies, although they tend to be at a more even uh, elevation. There's a very short leafless period. Of course, there you don't have um, the same you know, seasons that are taking place to require leafless conditions. There are more types and, and uh, stronger, um, higher magnitude, we could say, disturbances that come more frequently. Just overall, there's a higher, what I call, biological tempo, just turnover of things. And generally, high temperature and a lot of water creates a lot of weathering and changing conditions that drives a lot of biological change. And as a result of all that, there tends to be an even stronger response to land use. And if you've ever seen a video of a clear-cut area in a tropics, and people trying to walk in it, um, it's, you can really get a sense of that. Um, if you watch the movie Burden of Dreams that shows the making of Werner Herzog's um, movie Fitzgeraldo, you can see how treacherous it was for them once they cut down an area of the tropics and were trying to, to work there. Okay, so I'm going to present two case studies and we can move through this relatively quickly. Both are by Hurwitz. The first one was done in 1985, and the second is a follow-up the following year. The objectives of the first study were to first test for the significance of interspecific variation. That means the differences between species, looking at five different species represented by 51 canopy trees that were studied. The second goal approximate the maximum interception storage capacity for the 51 mature canopy trees in, in a tropical rainforest. And then the third, determine the condition, the contribution, sorry, of branch and trunk surfaces, so essentially the woody surfaces, to total interception storage capacity for these large canopy trees. <coughs> the study was done in an area of north, northeastern Australia called the Atherton Tableland. So um, in the northeast of Australia, that's the really tropical area, and that's Queensland. Um, if you start at the coast to the east, you have the area where the Great Barrier Reef is, and then you move inland a little bit, there's the highly altered, you know, uh, settled area, 
And then there's this traumatic, uh, really beautiful escarpment where it's it's a tropical forest because they just can't uh, change that kind of escarpment. It isn't you know the, the the land use there is relatively limited, other than just ecotourism. Um, and then when you get to the top of the escarpment, you're on this vast plateau called the Atherton Tableland. Highly recommend visiting it. In this case, the study was done in a relatively small area. Um, there were very intense peak rainfalls, up to 414 millimeters per hour of rain. Um, you know, relatively modest stem density compared to the studies we saw in temperate and uh, uh, semi-arid conditions, but 45 species present at the site with, a, with, with an average diameter of grass height of 71 centimeters. Okay. So what did they do? Well, they wanted to get a sense of the overall interception uh, capacity. So what they did is something we haven't seen before. They took saplings, which are the smaller trees, and they cut them off at the base and took that tree, kind of like hangman style, brought it into the lab and hung it from a weighing scale. Then they used a what's called a rainfall simulator, which is essentially just a giant sprinkler that very evenly sprays water onto the trees and they directly measured the amount of water that was taken up by the tree because as you sprinkle water on the tree some of it falls through and hits the ground and some of it stays on the tree and as it stays on the tree that increases the weight of the tree so you can see the change in weight through time and relate that to uh, an amount of water knowing how much you've put in uh, and how much you know came out they also measured the leaf surface area and the trunk area, what they call the woody area, by direct measurements. Then they took samples of bark, which is a, another common method. They took the bark and weighed it, you know, when it was, you know, really dry, then put it in a jar of water and left it there for a long time and then weighed it again um, to, to see what the wet weight was. And by the difference of those two, you can get at the, um, the wet the wet um, storage capacity of the bark. They also made field measurements of the leaf area index, which I've already defined for you twice, and then also what they called the woody area index. So if you think of the branches and the stem, uh, you can similarly come up with the one-sided area of that and have the woody area index. They then looked at the storage capacity for each species per unit area based on what they saw in the saplings and with these bark measurements. And then they just scale that up from the sapling size to a full-size tree, if you know the area of, of, of a full-size tree. Now, the only downside with this is it assumes that, um, that the, um, the, the, the you know, branching, I guess, I guess the potential for saplings to hold water would be the same for a full-grown tree. Like, there's no uh, scale dependence, which I'm not entirely convinced of. But anyway, this is a pretty common technique because it's not like you could take a vast tree and hang it from a scale off a crane or something. Okay, so here's the first results that they got. On the x-axis is time, so they're hanging the, each individual tree of each species. And then on the y-axis, you can see the leaf surface storage, milliliters of water per square meter of tree uh, for the leaves. And you can see that um, you know it takes about 20 minutes. You see in the first 20 minutes, we're increasing that storage. Water is accumulating in the tree. Once you hit about 20 minutes, the, the rate starts to drop off. However, only in one case, this, this round line, do you see it really get flat. The other ones continue to accumulate, tree, uh, accumulate water. And what they learn from that is that actually water can go under the leaf and accumulate on the underside as well. And that process really begins later in the accumulation um, stage. So you can see there are significant differences between the individual species, uh, both in terms of the maximum capacity after like 30 to 40 minutes, and also in terms of the rate of increase through time. Now if we look at the interception storage um, as a function of leaf area index, so this is a typical kind of thing that we've seen before, we can see there's a reasonable relationship between the two. But now what they've done is they've stratified between flaky bark trees with the solid symbols and uh, smooth bark trees with the open triangles. You can see that flaky bark trees have a substantially higher interception storage than smooth bark trees. 
And the reason for that is, as you, it sounds like, you know, flaky bark has a lot more surface area. So even though that surface area isn't in the leaves, it's in the woody material, there's a significant amount of water that can be stored in that woody material, as shown here. So that would then lead you to try again, instead of looking at the leaf area index, look at the same relationship with the woody area index. And in fact, now we have a much better regression that's presented here. Um, so the magnitude on the y-axis is the same, uh, that same range, but we can see that um, each individual regression line is um, a better prediction, and <clears throat> we can see a strong differentiation between flaky bark trees and smooth bark trees. Finally, we can see that as a tree grows, that's indicated by an increase in truck, trunk diameter, which is shown on the x-axis, and as a result of that, we actually see a decrease in the, the ratio of, uh, well, okay, an increase in the amount of wood relative to the amount of leaves. I was thinking more in terms of the leaf perspective, but as trees get bigger, you have relatively fewer leaves, and that's reflected by an increase of the ratio of woody to leaf surface area, which is shown here. It's not a great relationship. I mean, actually, it's pretty bad, but, um, you know, still, given, let's see, they were reporting R, so you know this is uh, lesson two in bad statistics. Lesson one was when you show four points and you give an R squared, and, and you want anyone to believe that because uh, it's just it's just not not real. Um, in this case, we have an R of 0 0.51. Well, that means the R squared coefficient of determination is zero is ha is the square root of that. Uh, I'm sorry, that value squared, which is 0 but there are a lot of points, so my guess is it is a statistically significant relationship. It's just relatively low explanatory power. But I digress. Okay, so the second study, we're going to extend those ideas. Because when we looked at the um, through-fall interception and stem flow in temperate and semi-arid conditions, you may recall from Chapter 2 that stem flow was a relatively small amount of water. Um, it was a small fraction of water, too. It was kind of like 3 to 5% or so of the total amount of, uh, of uh, <coughs> precipitation. And so it was, a, it was a very hard thing to measure. In the tropics, yes, it remains a small percent, but because so much more water is raining down in the tropics, there's so much more stem flow present. And so you see different things when you look outside, and that stimulates questions about what is the effect of that stem flow in potentially eroding the ground and creating other processes? So the questions for this follow-on study are, how much stem flow occurs in the tropic in proportion to the amount of rain, the size of the tree trunks, and what you can think of as the canopy catchment area. So the canopy is funneling to the trunk in the same way that a whole watershed or, or catchment is funneling water on the land surface to the point at the watershed outlet. So how much of that canopy is contributing actively uh, at any one time to, to the stem flow? Also, how much does stem flow vary between trees? And then the really cool part is the amount of stem flow sufficient to overcome infiltration capacity and generate overland flow. And I'm going to just take a breather here. We'll come back to the idea of Hortonian overland flow in a minute. Okay, so the study here in this place is still the Atherton Tablelands, but now we're looking at the escarpment. So you can just see the transition. So in the up, far upper right, you can see um, the, the land use that's there, and then you have the escarpment with this beautiful mountain range, um, and then you head up into the tropics. So if you're looking at place for ecotourism, this is the place to go. Um, so we have a relatively small plot area here, 6.5 meters of rain per year. That's a lot of rain. Slope of 22%, so very steep. Large trees, but you know, relatively low density of trees. Of course, it's very steep land and not particularly high. So if we look at an individual tree, let's look at these concepts. So this is all now a stem flow perspective. And that's what's cool about looking at the tropics is that we couldn't get much of a stem flow perspective by only looking at the temperate or semi-arid regions in Chapter 2. So imagine that you have this tree trunk. Imagine rain is falling right on that same area. Okay, see this little cup where it says rainfall? That, that's like a cup that's the same diameter as the trees. It's more like a bucket the size of the diameter of the tree. And rain that would fall into that would just accumulate a certain depth. 
That's just the gross precipitation away from the tree in an area that has the same area as, as the diameter or the tree trunk, or the really the cross-sectional area of the tree. Now, the amount of stem flow that's being funneled from that could be more or it could be less than just the amount that would naturally fall on that spot in the absence of a tree. So there's this idea of the funnel ratio, which is the ratio of the stem flow volume, the actual volume, to the amount of water that would have fallen into that same trunk area if there was no tree there. That's the funnel ratio. The contributing area is where you take the stem flow volume and divide it by the rainfall rate, and that leaves you with um, something in units of, uh, of an area. And that area is the contributing area that would be supplying water. Now, it's a little bit tricky because, you know, let's say that you have 100 square meters of tree and you have a contributing area of 10, 10 square meters. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that only 10 square meters are contributing. That's would just, this is an, an equivalency. Because any one location could be contributing sometimes and not others. So the whole tree could be contributing or not at different times. But the net effect is, um, on average, I guess I should say, that it's probably a smaller amount than the whole tree. What they did, they used storage rain gauges, through fall gauges, you know, the usual cast of characters and this kind of measurement that I've already presented. Stem flow with collars and bins or tipping buckets. Um, direct measurement of the canopy and trunk areas. And then the last thing is that they measured infiltration. And um, this is the part that I'm going to get into in a little bit more uh, after I show you the stem flow results. But essentially, you can measure, remember infiltration is the rate at which water that hits the ground percolates down into the ground. So it's crossing that air-soil boundary. That infiltration rate is usually relatively slow. There's a device called a ring infiltrometer. Those of you who took my field methods in hydrology class um, you know, will fully understand what that means, or if you took soil physics, you, you, you've got it. If you, don't, if you haven't taken a class before, you might want to pause here and look up a ring infiltrometer. Um, this study used single ring, which isn't as good as a double ring, but it's still okay. But the challenge here is you've got a very, very steep slope. It's, it's not like uh, you know, you're on a flat farm field here in, in, in uh, you know, Central Cal Valley of California. When you have a 22 degrees and you're, you're heading straight down into that, um, that's pretty challenging. And then, of course, also the infiltrometer may or may not be representative of macropore flow that um, can take place where there are like fractures or openings in the soil or where there were roots or things like that. But nevertheless, if we look at the stem flow results, this table shows that there's high stem flow variability. So the stem flow that was measured um, it ranges from 6 liters to 70 liters. This is a dot, not a comma. So these are not thousands. It's just you know, 6.239. That's the minimum. So that's the stem flow. So if you take that stem flow, you divide it by you know, the rainfall right here, um, and the basal area, you can calculate a funneling ratio. The funneling ratio goes from 7 to 112. So that shows, really, compared to water just falling on that spot where the trunk is, you could have 100 times more water being funneled there by stem flow than would just rain there. That's a very focused, intense um, contribution of water. Compared to the effective crown area, which what ranges from 21 to 46 square meters, you see contributing area of about 1 you know, to, to 10. So you know, maybe a quarter of the crown is contributing at any one time, something like that. OK, now before I can go on to the infiltration process, I have to explain or remind you about the mechanisms of how water gets into the ground and how it runs off. So overall in hydrology, there are two primary concepts for how overland flow works. The first is called Hortonian overland flow. The second is called saturation or saturation excess overland flow. And in this study, they predicated it on Hortonian overland flow. So how that works is, imagine that you have a surface shown on the left in this schematic, um, and you have a rainfall rate of 0.75 inches per hour. And then the soil can absorb 0.75 inches per hour. Because those rates are, are the same, then all the water that's falling down is infiltrating into the ground, 
and um, there's no runoff. Okay. Now, when Hortonian overlay and flow makes the assumption or hypothesis, I guess you could say, that if the rainfall rate is higher than the infiltration rate, in this case, one and a half inches per hour versus one inch per hour, then that's going to lead to ponding on the surface, and then that ponded water is going to run off. So Hartonian overland flow is a mechanism in which the rainfall rate exceeds the infiltration rate, and as a result, you get runoff. There are places in the world where you can imagine that certainly works. For example, uh, if you go outside on a rainy day and look at a street on a sloped road, you'll see the water is moving as like, sheets of water over the surface. There's no doubt that there's Hortonian overland flow taking place um, on a roadbed. However, for many natural landscapes, it's much more common to think of a saturation overland flow. So this shows a profile from an upland to a lowland where we're ending in a stream. Um, the ground surface is shown as a like, brown line with a litter layer on top of it. And then deeper down under the ground is a water table that's far away from the upland, perhaps, but quite close to the lowlands. Um, and what this is illustrating is that when water, when rainfall hits the ground, it, it very commonly can infiltrate without any problem because not only does the water have to, it, can it move through just the pores in the soil, but there often are fractures or what we call macro pores, like larger openings in the ground that allows water to rapidly move in. Um, and so when it moves in, then water cannot you know, flow over the ground because it just goes down to the water table. However, when you look in the lowlands, the closer you get to the stream, um, the closer the water table is to the ground surface. So you can imagine that precipitation in this case could relatively quickly fill up the storage capacity of the soil and therefore the ground becomes fully saturated at which time, any more water falling on the ground really can't infiltrate in because the ground is full. So at that time, then you have runoff. And that saturation or overland flow or saturated overland flow or saturation excess overland flow, just people use different terms. In addition to that, there's this concept of shallow subsurface flow. In this case, they're showing it in the litter layer, but it's often present in the, um, you know, the, the, the zone of the soil that's unsaturated with water. Okay, so to just summarize again, there's a little bit of a divergence, but it's necessary. Um, Hortonian overland flow occurs when the rainfall rate exceeds the infiltration rate. Doesn't matter how much water is under the ground or not, we're just exceeding the capacity of the soil surface to absorb that water, and so water runs off. So in this study, we're going to assume Hortonian overland flow. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the total volume of water that's coming down the stem. That could be, I don't know, you know, 40 liters of water. And we're going to ask the question, if we assume that that water then washes off of the ground, I'm sorry, off of the tree onto the ground, it's going to then spread out. And as it spreads out, it has the opportunity to infiltrate. But it can only infiltrate at the rate of infiltration that's observed for that moisture condition. And so um, we have those direct measurements of the infiltration rate from the field study. So uh, as water is infiltrating, um, any more water that's applied than can infiltrate is going to spread further out. And it's going to keep spreading away until it reaches the full extent where all of that water can be infiltrated. There's two different concepts of how this could occur. One is if water is equally spreading in all directions around the tree, then we could take the tree diameter um, and we could take an outer diameter of water spreading around and create uh, you know, a donut here. Right? And basically, if we calculate the area of this donut, we could say, well, for any given amount of water, um, what is the distance that the water is going to go um, given the infiltration capacity of the soil before all that stem flow is taken up? Um, the alternative case is to recognize that because this is a 22% slope, it's very steep, there's no reason to expect water to go equally around the tree. It's much more likely to go in the, the downslope direction. So we could assume a rectangular direction and just ask the question, how far downslope can we go before all that stem flow is infiltrated? So this is really just sim simple geometry. If you worked out the math, 
it's not that hard because you're just taking volumes of water, dividing it by areas, and calculating distances. So this table shows the results. The first column is the stem flow. There's two different rainfall events done. One was a 42 minute event, the other was a six minute event. These, there are the different trees that were looked into. Um, that stem flow then was converted into a rate of stem flow, which is in units of cubic centimeters per minute, which ranged from what, anywhere from 800 to you know, 19,000 cubic centimeters per minute. Meanwhile, the infiltration rate is 0 0.62 cubic centimeters per square centimeter of land per minute. So we can, if you take um, this input rate and divide it by the infiltration rate, you end up with centimeters squared in the denominator there, but it's centimeters to the negative two, so it flips up to the top. So you end up getting an infiltration area. So if you just play this out, input rate over infiltration rate, you'll see you calculate an area. And now all we want to do is take that infiltration area that it takes to, to um, that you need to get all that water and then do it either into a donut shape, which is the radial distance, or in a rectangular shape, and you'll find these distances. So for radially, you see the distances are really small and uninteresting, but if you look at this downslope distance, you can see that the numbers get up to as much as 11 meters, which is like 33 feet. So why does this all matter? Like, what's motivating this desire to understand that? Uh, let me skip ahead uh, a few slides. So this is a tree in the tropics. I took this photo. And you can see how the roots are highly exposed. Um, here's another photo that came from the paper. Look at how much erosion has taken place. Like, large amounts of erosion, both vertically and laterally, exposing these roots. Um, so this photo, it's not as, as exciting of a photo because I'm standing on a boardwalk, but um, it, it really gives you a clearer sense of, of, how, of what's happening. And so you can see why we'd be interested in calculating the potential for stem flow to do this. Now my guess is on these very steep slopes, the through fall is doing a lot of work too, but it is an interesting idea to consider that stem flow could be playing an important role. Okay. Um, I'm going to torture you one last time with another difficult diagram. Um, instead of the ternary diagram, there's another way of presenting multiple variables on a piece of paper. Now, we don't tend to do this much anymore. Um, we prefer to just get multivariate linear regression equations because now we have Excel and uh, Mathematica and everything. We tend to not want to deal with these. But the truth is that these graphical representations can be very handy, especially from a conceptual standpoint if not so useful in getting actual numbers. So the way a diagram works, and I'm going to focus on the one on the right, um, they call this a nomograph. It just be, basically means a way of plotting many variables on one plot. So on the x-axis you have rainfall, and it goes from 0 0.1 to 100. So to torture you even more, that's a log scale. The y-axis is what we want to know, distance down slope. It's also in a log scale, so it's a log-log nomo, nomograph. Now what you have to do is you have to decide what funneling ratio and what basal error you want to be. So it's like three independent variables yielding one dependent result. So if we, let's say we specify a rainfall rate of 10 millimeters per hour, and we go up to a value of one funneling ratio, but with a basal area of 0 0.05 square meters, which are the thin lines. So I come up here, I head across, and I'm pretty much at something like half a meter downslope. So that's how this works. You go up to the line that represents the basal area and funneling ratio you want, and you head over. Now I know what you're thinking, or what I want you to be thinking, which is, what happens if your funneling ratio is 33 and your basal area is set 0 .0 uh, 0 0.11? Well, then it's way more complicated. In theory, you could interpolate these lines and find that spot and head across, but in practice, you're not going to get a very accurate result. But the important thing you can see here conceptually is that um, for any given funneling ratio, the larger the basal area, the farther the distance downslope you're going to get. Um, as you have a larger funneling ratio, the farther distance downslope you get. And then this is for the straight downslope direction, and so for a straight downslope direction, you're going to have bigger you know, bigger um, distances than for the radial. So that's what this, this plot shows. Okay, so in summary, 
it doesn't really matter where we are in a forest, but especially in a, in a tropical forest, we have a range of processes. We've seen precipitation, evapotranspiration, through fall, um, stem flow, and then now I've also introduced you to the concepts of Hortonian overland flow, um, the shallow subsurface flow, and then where we have contact between the groundwater table and the surface, then we can get saturation overland flow um, as the primary fluxes that are taking place. There's a few others shown on here as well. So I'm going to stop here to end part one, and then we'll continue on next with part two.